Hello everyone, I'm Annie Gibbons and you're listening to Memoirs of Successful Women, the podcast where you get to hear candid conversations with fascinating women from around the globe who share aspects of their business and life journey, how they measure their success and what they have learnt along the way. Well, hello, everybody. I'm so excited to be welcoming Dr. Wendy Labatt today to the Memoirs of Successful Women podcast. She's also known internationally as the financial healer. So you're going to be getting lots of financial discussion and information today, and she's going to be super excited to be telling you about her new book which I'll let her share about. She's an award-winning entrepreneur, strategist, speaker, and best-selling author. She's got a doctorate in business administration and is also the CEO of the Financial Cures LLC, which is a financial strategy and business development firm. She also serves as founder and CEO of Ascend Foundation Incorporated, which is a not-for-profit organization established to empower disadvantaged women to realize their dreams of entrepreneurship. So welcome to the program, Dr. Wendy. Well, thank you, Annie. It's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate the invitation. Oh, I'm super excited because I haven't had anyone on my podcast series uh, from that financial perspective. And I know you've got 36 years of experience nice. um, going from like zero knowledge in business to becoming, yeah, this international best-selling um, author on um, financial success for women particularly. And so tell me a little bit about uh, where you are now and then we'll unpack the journey that has been Dr. Wendy. Okay. Well, where I am now is, like you said, a best-selling author. Yay! And that's just <laughs> been in the last 10 days. So that's just how new it is to me. But, um, you know, I've, I'm a speaker, which is another new venture for me. Um, and then I've been in business 36 years. So I started back when there was no internet or social media. So this is a whole new pivot for me, you know, to go totally virtual and I'm not a technology person. So, you know, I'm, I'm old school. So I've had a few challenges, but you know, you got to go with the flow. So I can't complain. So the most exciting thing in your life at the moment is suddenly writing this book, Diagnose Your Financial Health, and you've put it on Amazon and within a week, you're a best-selling author. People are buying it globally. So what's in that book? Why should people buy that book? And how will it just, yeah, pretty much change their life in, from a financial health perspective? Well, um, you know, times have changed. We're in an uh, economic pandemic. So, things, you know, people are having to revisit their finances, even if those that made a lot of money and business owners, you know, because of the COVID pandemic, you know, people have had to change. People have lost jobs. They've closed businesses. They've downsized. So you have to really reevaluate where you are financially. And this book helps you do that. It goes back to the basics because, you know, once you have the basics, you can build from that. And once, you know, you get so high, even if, you know, you get knocked down, if you go back to the basics, you can start back up and get to where you want to be. So I've got all kind of little tips and, you know, informative information. The main thing is the six obstacles to winning the money game. That's sort of a big picture look at how to handle, you know, money regardless of the circumstances, you know, so there's six obstacles. And if you can, you know, overcome those, then basically you can come out okay. And it doesn't really have to be about what the economic environment is. Hmm. Interesting in the current economic environment that you're quite confident to say it's not all about the economic environment, it's around the obstacles. And so we will obviously make sure people buy the book to find out what the obstacles are. Uh, but, <laughs> but what do you think about people's attitude towards money? Do you think that's, I find a lot of people in, in my work sort of find, you know, they'll have an anchored belief about money and do they deserve money and should they, you know, it's almost like you, you, you do attract what you believe. Is there a significant mm -hmm. issue um, with how people feel about money or value money that sort of surfaces in your work? 
Well, that's one of the first obstacles is oh. mindset, you know, mindset and lack of knowledge because you have to have the right mindset. You can't want wealth and have a pauper's mindset. You know, yeah. you have to, for one, like you said, believe that you deserve money because it's not just about money. It's about, you know, being able to help other people. And the only yeah. way to help other people is to have some money. Not the only way, but that's the best way. You know, you can have knowledge, but even with the knowledge, you know, you need to be able to have finances to go with it. And then, you know, you don't want to struggle all the time. There are going to be struggles because life you know, has is full of struggles, but you want to be able to confidently be able to go beyond that, especially financially, because, you know, you, I find that people that have the most money, have the worst time managing it. So the folks that usually, you know, is are tight when money's tight, they know how to like my uh, grandmother used to say she can get a get blood out of a turnip. So, you know, and people that have money, you know, the main factors of money is your income, your expenses and your spending. And people track their income, they track those expenses, but they don't look at the spending and that's what kills a budget. That's what kills your finances. When you go out and you know spend uncontrollably, you know people say I can't afford this, I can't afford that, but my clients I give them a spending challenge and once they go through that they realize that they have money that they spend in areas that were really for non-essential you know stuff you know uh, yeah. stuff that they don't need they just want and think they need and mm -hmm. once they go through it one of my clients and it's so funny I always tell the story he went through the challenge and he said Wendy I spent eight hundred dollars eating out and it wasn't any business expense or anything like that. It was just, you know, a matter of him saying he was, you know, taking his wife out, grandkids and all that. And it wasn't that he couldn't afford it. It's just that he realized $800 could have gone somewhere else, you know, and been yeah. more effective, like to reduce debt or increase his cash reserves, you know, pay down some credit cards or whatever. But $800 eating out, it made him realize, like, let me track and start being more, you know, conscious of what I spend. And yeah. I find once yeah. they start being more conscious of what they spend, they can afford a lot more than they think they can afford. <laughs> I think that's a brilliant, brilliant point. It is all about the consciousness, isn't it? And that's it. When you, mm -hmm. when you're talking about your grandmother there, that's true. When you've got nothing, you know where every little cent has gone, mm -hmm. right? Because your focus, your attention is on, is it coming in? Is it going out? How do I spend it? What do I value? If I had mm -hmm. a few, few um, coins or dollars, what would I spend it on? You know, you've just got all of this emotional focus and I work a lot on yes, yeah. yeah, clarity, focus um, and mm -hmm. keeping things simple. So it's really interesting that that's right. Once you've got a bit more, you become a bit more casual and it's, mm -hmm. it's interesting that you then suddenly go, oh, I just spend money, but I feel like I still don't have any. Um, mm -hmm. And it's probably because our focus, focus doesn't sort of go into those areas that, um, that's right, it just suddenly slips out, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I said in your introduction, you know, you've got a, a master's of business and you've got your own company. How did, you, um, how did you get to that stage when you suddenly started 36 years ago and you suddenly thought, well, okay, well, I'm in finance, I'll, I'll start my own business. What was that journey like for you, for those people who were thinking, okay, well, here we are in COVID, I'm going to be like Dr. <laughs> Wendy, I'm going to set up my own business and so what has the journey been like for you? Okay, well, it's an unexpected journey because I wanted to be a medical doctor. You know, I didn't get accepted to medical school, so I'm like heartbroken because I didn't have a plan B, but I ended up, um, I lived in, you know, in Europe for a couple years, and then when I came back to the States, I couldn't find a good job. You know, I, before I left the States, I, you know, worked in the lab making good money and you know, I didn't get accepted to medical school, but I was making good money. You know? And then when I came to Georgia, it was such a different culture that nobody would hire me because I had this MBA, you know, I had all these, you know, years of experience in the lab and the people that were hiring didn't have those things. So I was kind of a threat to them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they were grandfathered in, you know, they got in 20, 30 years before and they didn't have to have all that. So I ended up, you know, working and being, you know, miserable. So I started uh, working for a company 
that was, you know, fe featured in this magazine, Black Enterprise. It was a sales position. I had never sold anything, didn't know about selling. And uh, once I got the position after two weeks when it's time to get paid, he said he couldn't afford to pay us because he was going bankrupt. <laughs> so I ended up, you know, talking to my dad. We started the business. And then my dad and I kind of clashed. You know, he was kind of the money guy and I was the workhorse. And once things didn't work out between us, I just, you know, went out on my own with no experience, no money. And like I said, it was a time where there was no uh, internet, social media. And the only thing you could do with the cell phone was make an expensive phone call. Yeah. And um, when I, you know, pursued the corporate clients, you had to have the brick and mortar, the, you know, employees, inventory, all the overhead that went with it in order to be considered or perceived to be, you know, capable of handling the big contracts. So of course I wanted the big contracts, but my cash flow didn't match my facade. <laughs> so things got pretty tight. You know, it was really kind of tight. So I started learning. I had some good mentors that kind of taught me how to, you know, work things out with what I had. So you learn how to take control of your finances. You work, learn how to make your money work for you. You know, learn how to negotiate with your customers and with your vendors. And next thing I know, I was, you know, doing creative things to, you know, get the things I needed as well as, you know, take control of my finances. So it really worked out well. It was a hard lesson, but it was worth every, you know, ache and pain because, you know, you learn from doing and you learn from mm -hmm. experiencing. And that's, you know, what helped me then. But in 2014 here in America, they um, enacted the Affordable Care Act. Mm -hmm. And it required or mandated that everybody have health insurance. So I expanded my business. At that time, I was in the tax business. So I expanded that business to include insurance and financial services. So I didn't want to be a hypocrite. So I bought everything I was trying to sell my clients more for um, business and marketing purposes, not for just personal, you know, planning yeah. purposes. So, um, you know, because I had clients that said, well, what do you have? You know, or where's your money? And I could honestly say what I had, where my money was. So it worked out pretty good. But in 2017, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. Mm. And my chemotherapy was every three weeks for a year at a cost of $67,000 every visit. So every three weeks, that bill was $67,000. I had to have five surgeries all the MRIs, CAT scans, you know, mammograms, everything that goes with treating cancer. Yeah. And those bills yeah. came up to, you know, $300,000, a little over $300,000. And if I didn't have the proper protection uh, and practice what I preach, you know, my health insurance paid for all of that. You know, yeah. I could have been ruined financially because I don't know about you, but you know, coughing up $67,000 every three weeks could have been a challenge. <laughs> Seriously so, going to wreck your cash flow. <laughs> I know. And 300000 and then, you know, also having your business and personal expenses, it, you know, it would have ruined me financially. But because I practiced what I preached and had those things in place, I was able not to have to worry about any of that. And then I had supplemental coverage that brought me in a significant, multi six figure tax free income that allowed me to you know not worry about money so I was able to recover and work on my you know therapy and beat cancer and not worry about money not being stressed about money because you know even if you have some coming if you don't have enough and you have those kind of expenses it could be more stressful than the disease itself so that really helped me out and that's when I to call this, you know, wow, I discovered the financial cure. And hence, that's where the company, you know, name came from. And that's where I started my financial cure system to empower other people to, you know, be in the same position. Because, you know, with COVID, especially, you know, one disease, one illness, one injury can ruin you financially. But if you have the proper protection, then that's not going to be an issue. You know, the issue would be, recovery and not finance, you know, not financial disaster. Yeah. Oh, 
So beautifully said, and I think people have got so, so much to learn from you. I think one of the interesting things you said there, you've got to practice what you preach, you know, as, yeah. so as a woman in, in a leadership position, as a, as a role model for others, and this is your business, exactly. And that's what the client should ask you. Well, what do you have? What do you mm -hmm. do? And how has that worked for you? And uh, I think that's just so important. And you needed to learn that. You know, you've actually gone and said, yeah, well, I didn't have all these things, you know. Mm -hmm. You would have been broke. You would have been, you know, the, the thought of if you don't have that insurance in the US and you don't, mm -hmm. you then can't afford that sort of healthcare, it doesn't matter what job you had or whatever, if you're then in financial ruin, um, yes. you know, it all, it all falls apart. So first of all, I'm so thrilled that you've overcome that cancer. Brilliant. Yeah, oh, my gosh. <laughs> yes. How exciting is that? But, um, you know, to, to do that means that you've needed to have significant time to sort of step back, to look after yourself, mm -hmm. to go through all of that treatment and, and to be able to, yeah, suddenly I'm assuming it, it, it brought a whole lot of reevaluation uh, re on what you, you love and what's important in your life going through a it, it crisis does. like yeah. that. It does. And plus it also just makes you, you know, just realize that what's important that, you know, God has you. And I never thought that was a death sentence. Even when I got diagnosed, I, I had a sense of peace in my spirit about it, but I knew it wasn't going to be an easy journey. So I was like, Lord, you know, what do you want me to learn out of this? And then after everything worked out with the money and, you know, the insurance and everything, I'm like, okay, I'm cool. I don't have to do anything else. I just kind of wrote, you know, rest on my laurels and let my business just, you know, because it was sort of self-sufficient. But, you know, the spirit said, no, you know, we, I got you through this. You're going to help other people get in a position where they can be just like you. Because yeah. one of my colleagues, we talk about practicing what we preach. One of my colleagues, this was well before I got diagnosed, he uh, went on a, you know, regular physical and was diagnosed with your, uh, kidney cancer. I'm like, kidney cancer. <laughs> And he and I said, well, I know you're going to clock some dollars. I said, I'm sorry to hear about your diagnosis, but, you know, kind of kidding with him because I knew all the coverage that I had purchased. Mm. And he said, Wendy, I don't even have health insurance. It's like, what? You're in the insurance business. You don't have health insurance, which means you don't have these other supplemental coverages. And now he can't get it. You know, once you're diagnosed with cancer, you, I mean, he can get health insurance, but he can't get, you know, the supplemental stuff that brings in the big money. And I've just really felt for him because like I said, if you don't, yeah. he was kind of, he was being a hypocrite. It wasn't kind of, he was, you know, trying to sell all this stuff to other people, but he didn't have it for himself. So that just confirmed, you know, the fact that me getting the products at that time, I didn't have cancer. So I never thought I was going to get cancer, but it yeah. confirmed that, hey, I did the right thing and I'm doing the right thing by practicing what I preach. So, you know, it's just, and that's why I tell people, it's like, I'm not trying to make you or sell you anything. I'm trying to empower you with the knowledge to make decisions that will protect you and your family. Uh, if you choose to get it, that's great. But if you choose not to, you know, I've done my fiduciary, you know, part to let you know that it's available. Mm. Yeah. How do you create generational wealth? How do people sort of go, okay, not just for me, I'm going to change my circumstances, for, but for my family? That would be a big factor for people. It is. And there are four pillars to uh, generating, uh, creating generational wealth. The first thing like I said is the mindset, the knowledge. You have to, you know, be forward thinking. The second thing is, you know, entrepreneurship or business ownership. You know, you, you have to take advantage of that entity because, I mean, you could work for somebody and you can create it from there, but you want to not just leave the financial part, but you want to leave the, the legacy of, of being able to be your own boss, you know, being able to create your own paycheck and create paychecks for others. So that's the second uh, pillar. The third one is real estate, because, you know, you can't will an apartment you're renting to somebody else. Well, in New York, you can rent, you know, will the lease because you know how they have all that in New York. But, you know, you need to leave real estate because that's an asset that can go on for generations and generations. You know, it can uh, bring passive income and, you know, 
allow people to, you know, have money or even if they don't rent it out, have a place that's fully paid for that they're living in themselves and they don't have to worry about a mortgage or anything like that. And then the last thing is insurance. People use insurance to build that generational wealth because they've got uh, what we call an index universal life. And it gives you three protections or three buckets of money in one for the same price of regular old traditional insurance. You get the traditional death benefit that pays your family when you die. You get what they call living benefits where you can uh, draw up to 90% from your death benefit, say you have a $500,000 policy, if you get stricken with a a critical or chronic illness or injury, you can draw up to 90% of that Mm -hmm. and still leave your family, in case of like say a 500,000, you draw 450,000, still leave 50,000 for your family in case you pass away. Mm -hmm. And then it has uh, a wealth or equity building arm that builds that's indexed to the market. So you can't, there's no market loss or market risk or investment loss. So even if the market drops, you've got a floor that protects you. So Mm -hmm. that's, you know, that's the way. And then what we do is we get people to get their babies and their kids, you know, a policy when they're young. So by the time they grow, you know, to be teenagers or college age, they got money for a car or for school or whatever. And we call that the million million dollar baby fund because your child can have a million dollars if you start young and, you know, and make the right investment. So that's what, you know, that's, those are the four pillars understanding how to do it, um, becoming an entrepreneur, business owner, having the real estate investments or real estate holdings, and then the uh, insurance policies. So those are the four pillars. And, and it's important because there are a lot of people whose parents or grandparents, you know, especially my age, you know, I know a lot of my colleagues, well, they're older now, so they're parents and grandparents, but they're they had real estate, not only houses, they had land that Mm. their parents bought or, but then they sold it off, you know, and then some of them had like six brothers and sisters. So, you know, they saw this opportunity to get a little money and then they sold it off and then they don't even know where the money went. You know, they sold off the asset and don't know where the money went. So that's, you know, you want to get away from that. You want to keep that, you know, the Bible says a good man or a good woman leaves, you know, an inheritance for his children's children. So mm. that's how you build your generational wealth. Wow. Brilliant. Brilliant. I'm thinking my kids would have wanted your million dollar baby fund. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, how old are your kids? I should have sent them to you earlier. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, if they can get it for their, their kids and if they're young enough, they can still get it. Yeah, they can still get it, you know, especially while they're healthy and get it now while you can, because like I said, health is your wealth, because once you lose it, you Mm. know, there's nothing you can do. You can't get it back. Oh, there's so much value here, Wendy. Um, What about, do you think, I don't know what the education's like in the US, but in our education system, you know, it obviously teaches you all of these subjects, but it really doesn't teach you how to manage money how to actually live, how to be practically managed. That's right. When you start working, your tax, insurance, your financial management, none of that is in our education system. Mm -hmm. Is that like that in the US? So you suddenly see and you go, I don't know, I get a job and then suddenly I get paid and you don't have these skills. Yeah, you don't have them here either. Matter of fact, the this in the skills you're taught in the US are how to pass tests, you know, because your, yeah. your funding is based on, you know, so many people, so many of the students passing a test at a certain level. And that's what they teach. And that's unfortunate because when I was growing up, like I said, I'm old school, we learned reading, we learned how to write, cursive write, we learned geography, you know, all kind of stuff that they don't even learn now. You know, you ask a kid to look at a map or they're going to put it in an app to find out how to go. And they don't even know what city or capital or what state. So, you know, we learn those basics, you know, we learn how to add and, you know, everybody now the cash registers tell you how much change to give back. You know, if you take that away, a lot of these folks, not just kids, but adults can't count enough to give you the correct change. So it's unfortunate that we aren't learning those kind of things. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm just thank the Lord that I, 
did grow up old school because we learned those things and my parents and my grandparents, they taught us that kind of stuff, not just counting on the school teaching us. When we came home, we had to apply that stuff at at what we were doing at home, you know, and that's not happening nowadays. And it's unfortunate. Hmm. Interesting. Oh yeah. I think it really is unfortunate because that's right. A lot of the focus is on how to get to the next level of academic success. Mm -hmm. It's actually not on the application of of life and managing those funds. So I'm thinking for those um, younger women who, um, or older women who are thinking of now, you know, now's the time I'm going to become an entrepreneur. I could make that big, bold decision like Wendy. You went and mentioned before that you did it 36 years ago with no skills and, and, you know, and how much you've learned and changed. Do you think um, that people can do that now and just dive into the market or do you feel that the current market is so complex and, and different that they need to join a program, they need to learn specific skills? Well, my thing is personally, I say, if the spirit leads you to do it, do it because whatever, if you're doing it, like for me, I did it because the spirit led me. It's not because I you know, I enjoyed doing it so much and wasn't making money. That's how I know it was spirit. This is kind of hindsight looking at it, you know, but I had so much pleasure in and joy in just the activities of entrepreneurship. And like I said, I wasn't making money. So Mm -hmm. money wasn't a priority. I had made money and was miserable. So the fact that I could be happy doing something and, and not work, you know, not make money, but, but everything was still falling into place. You know, it wasn't that it was so easy, but like I said, when God gives you the provision, he uh, gives you the vision, he gives you the provisions to go with it. So I would say if someone's interested, you know, I didn't do the business plan and all that. And a lot of people say, oh, you got to have the business plan. You got to do that. <laughs> I learned about that after the fact, but you know, a business plan is sort of like a, a roadmap. But sometimes you have to take detours and you can't, you know, some people are so stuck on the business plan, they don't take advantage of the detours. And it's the detours that really gets you to where you're supposed to be. So um, I'd say do it. You know, I'm the kind of, hey, just do it and figure it out as you go along. But if you're fortunate enough to have a mentor that can guide you along the way, that's even a bigger blessing, but I'm not too stuck on, you know, I've got credentials. Yes. But the credentials I have weren't in business. You know, they were in science because I wanted to be a medical doctor. Now my doctorate degree, I just got, you know, while I was going through the cancer. So it wasn't that that was sort of like a night expensive marketing thing, you know, (laughs) it gives credibility, but it, you know, it, it was timely and it was costly, but it didn't, I mean, I learned, but I knew already I had been in business like 30, about 32 years when I actually started it. So I, you know, I already had the experience. It was just getting the title just to, you know, icing on the cake. So I'm not a big, even though I got the degrees and all that, I'm just not hung up on all that to start. I figure if, if the spirit or something's, you know, yearning at you to do it, do it. I don't care if you just got a sixth grade education. Yeah. You're supposed to be doing whatever it is the spirit is leading you to do. Mm. Yeah. And I think the most successful people in the world have done that. They've actually, it's because of their purpose. It's because of what, Mm -hmm. this is what I want to achieve. There's value in it for them. They, they see the benefit or they're excited by it. You know, it's their thing. And then that's right. They'll, they'll dive into that. They'll learn along the way. They'll, they're able to then um, navigate, pivot, um, adapt to those different directions and, and that's okay. So it's, they give themselves permission to fail. They give themselves mm. permission to learn, you know, to, to adapt. Um, rather, and wh- whereas we're not saying that um, qualifications aren't important, they are. And, and some steps are necessary that you do get those qualifications, but you can do it and you can acquire qualifications on the way, mm-hmm. um, which do really, and I've done that the same way. You know, I was, a head, I was a head teacher of a nursing school before I then did the Masters of Education. And I actually did it the other way around going, oh, yeah, I can see that's why I do that. That, that's why I do that. It actually boxed everything, <laughs> mm-hmm. but I didn't necessarily learn that much. It actually re- re- reassured me 
me um, and it gave me a structure academically, mm -hmm. but it didn't sort of change those skills. Whereas other things I've done, like Lean Six Sigma or something, it'll actually tell me mm -hmm. a whole new concept of, you know, waste management and, and efficiency that I didn't know before. And it, it helped mm -hmm. me make new decisions. So mm -hmm. I think that's, that's so valuable. Now, you also have work for a not-for-profit. How does that, because then a lot of successful people I know have a real, you know, a lot of value for you is giving back. So what mm -hmm. does that look like? What do you do for this nonprofit organization? Well, I'm the founder and CEO uh, because, like I said, I have clients, especially some of my tax clients. They're single mothers. They got businesses, but they're what they call hustles. You know, they don't want to formalize it. But like I tell them, in order to really take advantage of it tax wise, you know, get off get from under the table, get on board, you know, structure your business and make as much money as you want to make. But when they're under the table, they want to limit themselves because they're scared they're going to have to report it or, you know, they don't, they don't take advantage of the opportunities to own their own business, even though they're operating as a business owner because they, you know, they have a product or a service that they're selling but they're not formally structured with, you know, a, a business entity like a LLC or anything like that. They don't have a separate bank account for it. And I, t you know, I've counseled quite a few of them, but I said, okay, I start this uh, nonprofit. I can make it a formal program that they can go through. And I've, I've had it since 2014, but I haven't effectively implemented it um you know i've got the program set up and everything and i was about to you know get some space so that people can come for their classes but then COVID hit so it kind of worked out because now we can do it virtually but i'm yeah. i'm on such a roller coaster with this new venture the financial <laughs> cures i really haven't had a chance to focus back on it but it's coming you know it all falls into place the way it's supposed to but that's really about helping you know young women disadvantaged women whether it's economic or racial or whatever give them a chance to understand or and overcome the six obstacles of winning the money game so yeah. they can you know provide for their families without struggle they can you know create jobs be you know productive citizens of the community and you know women are powerhouses you know we make ends meet we do what needs to be done especially for our families so this just helps them be in a better position to do what needs to be done you know to fulfill their dreams and fulfill their purpose in a formal way that they can benefit and help others yeah oh you would be such a blessing to them wendy so i'm i'm just delighted to hear what you do because this adds so much value to people who are struggling and a lot of that is you know it is um circumstance is really hard you know people have very difficult circumstances due to generational poverty um you know that's right racial racial tensions and disadvantage uh, it could be disability could be a variety of factors and so to have someone who can um, put real solid foundations, you know, and that's what a, a lot of your program and your teaching is all about. It's not about the quick yes. wins. It's not about, oh, well, here's this tip and then you'll make a million dollars. It actually, you know, through this conversation has shown me, yeah, a lot of it is just really consolidating good frameworks. It's systems. Yes. It's, it's constantly assessing and modifying what you've got, why you're doing it. Are you protecting yourself? Are you growing? Are you seeking opportunities mm -hmm. uh, to be able to um, expand and develop? in the areas that you want to do and then with that will then come we'll we'll reap the reward right yeah um, so. yeah you don't do it for money you know you do it for satisfaction because yeah. the money will come but when you do things for money you lose perspective you know you find yourself doing things that you really shouldn't do i shouldn't say shouldn't do but probably shouldn't do <laughs> but yeah. you know when you do it for purpose you look for satisfaction you know that's what gives you you know the pleasure and then once you get satisfied all the other things come along with it you know when you're yes. doing the right thing and you're helping other people and you're following you know the spirit whatever that leading is then everything else falls right into place so yeah that's yeah. my belief uh, look, I totally believe that too, because that's right. If you want to do it for money, you're just focusing on that goal and what is that dollar value and what does it mean? And you don't, you lose that perspective. Whereas if you're in a space, if you make space for something that you truly 
desire for other reasons, you know. And I've noticed that even by, from um, having my biography coming out in your book, you'll notice as soon as you put something out, people want to know how many books you've sold. You know, it's mm. the you know, and you kind of go, well, that's that's good, but I did the book for a different reason. You know, mm. you know, obviously we do everything because we want it to be successful, and we'll celebrate mm. that. But I didn't write the book that I would sell whatever the magic number is. I wrote yeah. the book because I wanted to share my life and to empower others and to do these things. It's the same mm. as when I created my magic transformation program, I want to do it because I want to help people, women transform their lives in business Mm -hmm. um, and um, their personal life. And so I didn't do it to go, I want to make a certain amount of money. I wanted to create an environment that if I'm loving what I'm doing and I'm, and people are at it getting value, then that will then attract wealth, right? You know, if you're in that that space, if you're investing in the purpose of what you wanting, wanting to do, what was the real, real desire, then um, that will attract other people because I want to be yeah. part of that right you know yeah that's for sure and then too like I said it's not about the numbers and the money and you know I mean you're a business that you have to you know look at that but you know I didn't expect you know when we launched the book which we were supposed to do tomorrow I didn't expect it to even be that popular right away you know we were supposed to do this big campaign best-selling campaign number one best-selling and we and we're still gonna do it but the fact that i got that status in a few days i'm like thank you jesus you know it goes to show (laughs) that when you're supposed to be where you're supposed to be you're going to be there whether you're doing it or not you know you do what you're supposed to do and then god works everything else out so i'm just excited and I'm just, I don't, every time I think about it, I tell my husband, you know, I'm just so excited every time I think about the book, <laughs> you know, and it's just because, you know, people have bought it and the feedback has been great. People saying, oh, wow, well, I really learned something, which is, you know, really what it's all about. You're supposed to learn something, you know, and, it's not, and that's what helps me, you know, just, and, the, and, the, and another thing is that the people support me because I've been you know, a person of integrity, you know, you're a person of your word and people trust what you say. And that made me feel good. Just the fact that I said, okay, I wrote this book and they went out and bought it, you know, because I wrote it and not necessarily because they thought it was going to bring them something. They just trusted if I put it out there, it's going to be worth buying. So that was, you know, that made me feel real good. Oh, I think that is just, yeah, that's just touched my heart, Wendy. And I know this, you know, this podcast is Memoirs of Successful Women. And I was just going to ask you, well, what does success look like? And you've almost answered it in that, uh, in that (laughs) phrase, you know, I will let you say some more, but it's like, yes, I want, you know, the fact that you yourself say, I have lived my life in a certain way. You know, people know when they know, when they meet Dr. Wendy, this is who, you know, who she is. This is her character. This is her integrity. This is how her businesses have operated. And so th- therefore there is a trust. And, you know, and then when you put out a book, it's kind of like going, well, if Dr. Wendy sort of says it, I want to know that. Uh, yeah. And that's, that, that is a real sign of success for me because it's, you know, it's, it's not just about, oh, here's something that will um, make them something they actually want to learn from you and what mm-hmm. what you stand for and I think that's that's a wonderful uh, tribute to the woman that you are and so well, you thank you take that as, as a yeah. as a blessing you know uh, I do. yeah I don't take it for granted because you know especially the way things are going now in the world you know especially in the in America you know we got this election coming up and it's just that we've gotten so negative you know I'm like <laughs> I don't want to hear any more <laughs> negativity you know I just you get tired of that I'm not a negative person and I don't allow that energy into my space but you know if you look at the news and I try to stay abreast of what's going on because you know I'm in the finance business yeah. so I need to know and it's you know global but I get tired of it and I pray every day that the Lord will you know get that negative hatred out of out of the world especially you know in the politics you know you can be political without being hateful and i'm just tired of it but you know hey that's the way of the world i just keep the prayers going up and i know god got it covered (laughs) so i'm just saying that's what gives me peace is i know he's got it going on and he's going to work it out (laughs) but it is but you know the success is really doing 
what you're called to do, being satisfied or fulfilled with what you're doing, you know, and, and it's not about the money, you know, I mean, I make money, yes, and I appreciate that, but I don't do it for the money. And like I tell people, I am not trying to, um, you know, I mean, I want to sell books and that's great, but, you know, it's about helping people and empowering people, especially this time, you know, of economic downturn that they can understand how to get out of it because you can't count on the government. You can't count on other people. You mm -hmm. have to count on your efforts. You know, you yeah. do what it takes to get out, you know, that, that give it to me, help me out. You know, you need to learn how to fish and not be expecting people to give you fish to survive. <laughs> <laughs> exactly exactly yeah. learn how to do it and then you can do it forever more and pass that learning on to your yeah. next generation right mm -hmm. so let's yeah. finish here how do people buy diagnose your financial health where do they go wendy well they can go to amazon and it's there if they can put in diagnose your financial health or put in dr wendy labot and it'll pop up and just place your order and make sure you leave a review write a review so that you can let amazon know how i'm doing how you enjoyed it whether you did or didn't hopefully you will but you know that's how they can get it and i appreciate it and i appreciate you having me on it's always such a blast talking to you <laughs> So whenever I start my podcast, you're going to be one of my guests. I haven't gone there yet, but I'm sure it's coming down the pipeline. <laughs> oh, well, there you go. Oh, well, I would love to be on yours. I think it's going to be a hoot. And uh, yeah, I thank you so much for your sharing today. I thank you for your honesty in, you know, in the real journey, you know, and the journey, your journey has been amazing. And you are a super impressive lady, you know, like there's no oh, doubt about you. that. You've achieved so much for yourself in your own personal journey, but you've also now positioned yourself that you can give back you can help others you can share that and empower women all around the globe and and there's not one element of selfishness in that you know and that's what i'm yeah. hearing it's just a really lovely um in you know you've been inspiring to me and i'm sure those who are listening because you know that's right success truly successful people aren't just in it for themselves they they reach a level and we all strive and and are in our own zone and then they reach a time that they go oh my gosh i can actually give back and i can help other people and i also um picked up that message that you've got total clarity you know you, you can actually have clarity around what you want to achieve and make it simple and then you know but getting to a stage where you can put out a book like this and make things simple for other people you know and we all do that we do those sorts of things in our coaching programs and those that we we mentor we actually go because of our learning we can actually trim it down and remove the distractors mm -hmm. and remove the anchors and all those limiting beliefs yeah. and and uh, and that's that gives women you know real hope that you can you yeah. can actually achieve whatever you want to achieve just just get on get into that right space and uh yeah i've really enjoyed our conversation today so Me thank too. you thank you i appreciate it thank you and i'm going to messenger you to get all your contact information because i'm going to send you an Autograph copy. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to reciprocate. I'll send you okay. one. And send me one. Okay. All right. Then. All Sounds this good. together. So we'll be yeah. changing. And everyone listening, all of Wendy's details will be on my podcast platform. I'll, I'll definitely put down all the ways that you can reach Wendy if something's resonated with you today. And uh, it's just really great having an opportunity to, yeah, really expand those women globally who, who help and inspire us um, all. So thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Annie. Love you. <laughs> You're a beautiful woman yourself, so I'm excited to know you. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Memoirs of Successful Women. You can find me at AnnieGibbons.com, where you can download my free resources, get connected on social, and check out my online magic transformation program. If you love this show, feel free to subscribe to future episodes and, of course, share it with your friends. I'll see you again soon and until then, happy podcasting. <laughs>